Oh, that's okay. It's fine. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien is one of the most influential myth makers of the 20th century. He is widely praised for the originality of his grand creative work known as the Legendarium, of which the Lord of the Rings is only a part. Yet he also has a reputation for taking pre-existing legends and fairy tales and incorporating them into his own creative world. One such well of inspiration from which he draws is the Arthurian tradition, also known as the Matter of Britain. While Arthurian influences are apparent in many of the legendary narratives, characters, and locations, Tolkien's relationship with these pre-existing legends is far from simple. He speaks critically of the Arthurian canon for its treatment of language, the fairy tale genre, and religion. Therefore, while he takes from this tradition and corrects, he corrects what he sees as the flaws of previous mythmakers and creates something tailored to his own tastes, yet with detectable Arthurian flavors. Tolkien's revisionary approach to the Arthurian tradition is apparent throughout many of the stories of the Legendarium, but a microcosm of Tolkien's wider approach can be found in the story of Anne Arundel the Mariner, one of the legendary heroes of the Silmarillion, whom Tolkien establishes as a mythical figure to rival even King Arthur himself. To provide context on Tolkien's attitude towards Arthurian literature that manifests within the Legendarium, it is important to consult his letters. In one letter, Tolkien relates his motivations for the creation of the Legendarium. He claims that England is lacking in legends that are specifically tied to the English language, prompting him to create his own. He acknowledges the existence of the Arthurian world and concedes that it is powerful, but it is clearly not to his tastes. He provides three criticisms for this canon. He laments its lack of connection to the English language, evidently alluding to Arthur's Celtic origins and continental influences. He denigrates the fantastical or fairy tale elements of the legends, which he calls incoherent and repetitive. And finally, although himself a Christian, he critiques the canon's overt inclusion of Christianity, preferring a more implicit treatment of religion within fairy tales. His comments in this letter connect his perception of the Arthurian canon's shortcomings with his own desire to create a new mythology, suggesting that he seeks in his own writings to compensate for these specific flaws while drawing from the elements of this literary tradition that he deems to be powerful. Tolkien's Legendarium abounds with examples of Arthurian influence and a marked avoidance of Arthurian tropes. But I intend to narrow my scope down to the level of a case study of one of his most formative creations, Arendelle. Living 6,000 years before the events of the Lord of the Rings, Arendelle is a half-elven, half-human refugee embroiled in the hopeless war against the Dark Lord. He sets sail across the sea to the mythical land of Valinor to plead the angelic beings known as the Valar for help in the war. He is ultimately successful, and the Valar raise him and his ship into the heavens to become the Morning Star as a herald of the armies of Valinor who vanquished the Dark Lord. Though he is not specifically referred to as a knight, through his voyage he becomes the quintessential figure of a knight errant and would not feel out of place in the matter of Britain. The Lord of the Rings features a poem recounting his errantry as he is reputedly lost on his episodic quest for Valinor. The poem even contains a catalog of his weapons, armor, and gear that would not feel out of place in a chivalric romance. While Tolkien's presentation of the character arguably gives him a general Arthurian flavor, there is little in these observations to point towards specific Arthurian parallels. There is, however, mm -hmm. evidence that Tolkien has in mind a far more particular Arthurian connection within the story of Arendelle. In a note to a planned section of Tolkien's contribution to the Arthurian canon, his unfinished poem, The Fall of Arthur, Tolkien mentions Arundel by name. In this outline, he envisions a new ending for the famous Sir Lancelot. After Arthur's passing, Lancelot sails away to seek his late king in Avalon, and Tolkien directly compares this knight to his own Arundel. Now, my case would be far simpler had Tolkien used this note to show Arundel as a Lancelot figure, but in essence, he does the opposite. 
conforming to pre-existing Lancelot to fit the shape of a character from his own mythology. In the fall of Arthur, Tolkien abides by Lancelot's traditional narrative of an affair with Queen Guinevere and conflict with Arthur, but he then gives Lancelot an Arendelle-inspired ending. Arendelle's tale has no equivalence to Lancelot's traditional love triangle narrative, and Tolkien's comparison between the two characters seems only to function in the context of his rewriting Lancelot as an Arendelle figure. Um, this strange Lancelot Arendelle link only becomes more muddled when read alongside another outline for the fall of Arthur, in which Tolkien refers to the Arthurian knight Sir Gawain having a ship named Windelock. Um, although it is impossible to prove, I believe this detail to be a nod to the theory of scholar Israel Gollange, who posits that the traditional name of Gowan's horse, uh, Grindelet, um, derives from a boat named Wingelot in Germanic folklore, belonging to a giant named Wade. Taken together, uh, it is, it, um, sorry, Tolkien states that the name of Arendil's ship, Wingelot, um, <laughs> is, is derived from Wade's boat, Wingelot. Taken together, it is clear that Tolkien intentionally links both his own creation, Arendil, and the Arthurian Gowan with the non-Arthurian legend of Wade. Um, the connection runs deeper still, linking Arendil and Gowan directly. The spelling of Wingalot for Gowan ship in the fall of Arthur is highly significant as this is the spelling that Tolkien uses in earlier drafts for Arendelle ship, Vindelot. This Gowan Arendelle parallel drastically complicates or even undermines Tolkien's Lancelot Arendelle link. Tolkien even seems to express hesitance over the parallel he draws between the characters, placing a question mark in the outline after the line about Gowan ship, Vindelot. Perhaps this, perhaps he's feeling the tension between the Lancelot Arendelle and Gowan Arendelle analogies. Um, making sense of these obscure parallels requires a comparative analysis of the narratives of Gowan and Arendelle. Tolkien was familiar with the medieval poem Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, having translated it into modern English himself. It is therefore reasonable to posit that this poem is a notable source of Arthurian inspiration for the author. We can see that both Sir Gawain and Arendelle set out on perilous journeys and become lost along the way. For both characters, their journey seems certain to end in death. Gawain believes that he heads toward his own beheading, while Arendelle seeks the immortal land of Valinor, which is forbidden to him on pain of death as a descendant of mortal men and exiled elves. Both characters are ultimately spared execution, but whereas Gawain is able to return home to Arthur's court, albeit changed by his experience, Arendil becomes a star and is forbidden to set foot on the mortal lands of Middle-earth ever again. It is where Arendil's story diverges from that of Gowan that it aligns with the story of another Arthurian knight, Sir Galahad. In the Legendarium, Arendil is the inheritor of one of the three Silmarils, magical jewels lit with the holy light of the two trees of Valinor. Tolkien scholar Verlin Flieger notes the similarities between the Holy Grail and the Silmarils. And with this analogy in mind, it is not difficult to construct a reading of Arendelle as a Galahad figure. Galahad seeks the Fisher King's castle in order to find the Grail, whereas Arendelle already possesses the Silmaril and carries it back to Valinor once it originates. Despite this difference, these holy objects play similarly central roles to the characters' quests to mythical locations. Uh, both relics even serve the function of measuring the worth of would-be possessors. Galahad reaches the grail through his purity, while the Silmarils burn the hands of any unworthy to hold them, and notably leave Arendelle unscathed. Through the power of the Holy Grail, Galahad is able to ascend to heaven, and similarly, the Silmaril becomes the source of the light of the star of Arendil when the Valar raised the mariner and his ship into the heavens. 
Arundel, fitting with Tolkien's aversion to avert religiosity, does not literally ascend to heaven as an afterlife. Instead, he becomes an immortal being who sails through the sky. The parallels to Galahad are nevertheless striking and seem to go beyond coincidence. Having established uh, uh, Arundel's Arthurian connections, it is useful to step beyond them to illustrate how Tolkien compensates uh, for what he perceives to be lacking in Arthurian literature by drawing from other traditions. So the name Aaron, uh, I mixed up the IPA between, <laughs> wait, never mind. <laughs> um, um, yeah, the name Arandil is um, inspired by the Old English name Arandel, um, which refers to the morning star, or the planet Venus, which is precisely the star that Arendelle becomes in the Legendarium. Therefore, Tolkien's tale of the mariner sailing the sky with the holy light of his Silmaril functions as an etiological myth of the morning star, giving Tolkien's mythos a more cosmological scope than that of the Arthurian legends. This Arendelle connection also accords with Tolkien's linguistic aims for the Legendarium. He, uh, though he gives Arundel a fictional etymology in his constructed elven language, Quenya, the name is a major example of the grounding of his writings in the history of the English language. Thus, Tolkien provides a linguistically English flavor to his mythology, compensating for the perceived lack of Englishness in Arthurian literature. Arundel also addresses another major complaint of Tolkien about Arthurian literature, its explicit inclusion of Christianity. Tolkien was specifically inspired by the Old English name Arundel, as it is used in the anonymous Anglo-Saxon poem, Christ One. And it is generally accepted that in this poem, Arundel is a reference to John the Baptist, who heralds Christ as the morning star heralds the sunrise. Tolkien states in a letter that the Old English representation of Arundel, or, or Arundel as Christ's herald is alien to his use, he elaborates, stating that Arendil lives during a time in which the knowledge of God, or Eru as he is known in Middle Earth, is not widespread. On the other hand, the Arthurian tales are set in an era where, in Britain, wherein Christianity is so ubiquitous that it is taken for granted. Tolkien intentionally writes against this aspect of Arthurian legend, sidestepping what he sees as the problematic inclusion of Christianity within the world of fairy tales by placing his legends in an imaginary era long before Christianity. Though Tolkien avoids overt Christian symbolism, Arundel is still undoubtedly a herald of salvation. He does not presage capital S salvation in a Christian sense, which in Tolkien's view comes through Christ, but rather a major victory in war. His story serves as um, as an example of the narrative trajectory of new catastrophe, which is Tolkien's own coinage to describe the sudden happy endings that characterize fairy tales. The ultimate new catastrophe for Tolkien is Christ's incarnation. Therefore, Arendelle's tale structurally echoes the foundational story of Christianity while avoiding allegory or explicit mentions of Christianity. Um, we can view Arundel's story as a model for what Tolkien views to be the appropriate treatment of religious themes within fairy tales. This subtle approach to religion is one of the clearest cases of Tolkien running directly against the norms of the Arthurian tradition. Arundel, as the herald of catastrophe, is also a figure who brings cohesion to the legendarium. While Tolkien speaks of Arthur and his world as incoherent, the same could scarcely be said for Arundel. As the descendant of many uh, important characters in the Silmarillion, the inheritor of the Silmaril, and one of the last survivors of the war, he becomes the emissaries of the hopes and sufferings of all those who came before him. Therefore, although he is only born toward the end of the Silmarillion, he becomes a, an important unifying figure of the story cycle, and the catastrophic victory against the Dark Lord that he helps achieve brings the first age of Middle-earth to a close. His importance extends into the Lord of the Rings, 
as the father of Elrond, the distant ancestor of Aragorn, uh, and the source of the starlight that Frodo carries with him to protect him on his quest. Samwise even speaks to Frodo about Eärendil and his life as a connecting thread between the legends of old and their present quest, reminding him that they are in the same tale still. Eärendil uh, occupies a place in Middle-earth comparable to that of Arthur in our modern world. In fact, Tolkien refers to Eärendil's son Elrond as a lord of more renown than Arthur would be were he still king at Winchester today. The same, and far more, could easily be said of Elrond's father, who is destined to sail the skies as a bright symbol of hope until the world's end. As his letters demonstrate, Tolkien views the matter of Britain as a highly flawed body of literature that nonetheless contains some great works. Therefore, he draws on those elements which accord with his tastes and alters or discards those that do not. He leaves behind the overt Christianity of characters like Galahad, uh, yet retains more implicit Christian themes in Eärendil's eucatastrophic tale. Eärendil also ties together the many tales of the legendarians into a cohesive whole while hearkening back to the pre-existing Arthurian legends and to the Anglo-Saxon language. Tolkien's attempt to correct the perceived shortcomings of the mythmakers of the past through his selective reuse and reshaping of Arthurian elements leaves readers with a new and unique body of myth, one that is fit to stand alongside the famous Arthurian tales. <laughs>